morning, guys. How we doing? Good, good. Good to be with you again. Uh, it is April 12th, 1945. Vice President Harry Truman is uh, spending the evening in some restaurant with his best friend, uh, Sam Rayburn, and, and he thinks that his day is over. He just finished a long day presiding over the Senate. He thinks that his work day is over, that it's time to rest and relax. Uh, but then he gets this urgent message that he's supposed to go to the entrance of the White House immediately. So he jumps in his car, travels over there, gets there to the entrance. Before he's even out of the car, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt is there waiting for him, and she walks up to him, she so unrolls the window and she tells him, the president, Franklin Roosevelt at the time, the president is dead. And Truman looked at her and he said, I, I'm so sorry, Eleanor, is there anything I can do for you? Her response to him was kind of interesting. She just looked at him and said, uh, is there anything we can do for you? You're the one who's in trouble now. And Truman knew she was right. Roosevelt is the longest sitting president in history. He had been in office for a little over 12 years, and during that time, he had done some really big things. He had brought America out of this deep, dark hole called the Great Depression, brought her back to stability again, and he had brought her through history's largest war, World War II, although they weren't completely out of the woods on that one yet. He had done all these things, and now he's gone, and everything that he's worked for is now at risk. Because that's how this goes so often in history, that when a great leader leaves, when a great leader dies, when a great leader departs, so does much of their work. Because often that, that great leader, their, their work, their organization, their nation, their church has been built on that man or woman's shoulders. It's been built on their giftedness and their, talented, uh, their talents and their uh, intelligence. And so when that person leaves, so often everything around them crumbles. Truman knows this, and he's just overwhelmed by that fact. In fact, he, he goes home later that night and writes in his journal, I'm going to try to get as much sleep as I can before I have to get up the next day and, quote, face the music. Doesn't sound like a man real excited about the new task in front of him. I got to believe that, that Elisha felt a lot like that. We're making the jump, actually, to 2 Kings today. 2 Kings chapter 2, if you want to go there in your Bibles. We're not going to read it quite yet. We'll get there in a minute, but you can go and hold your place. By now, you probably have figured this out, that Elijah is a pretty big deal. Elijah is widely considered to be, in fact, the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, and, and truthfully, one of the greatest figures in the Bible, period. Old Testament, New Testament, whatever. He's, he's one of the greatest ever. He, he does some of the most amazing and incredible miracles that we see in the Old Testament. He fights up against uh, two of the greatest villains in the scriptures, Ahab and Jezebel. He paves the way for many of the prophets coming after him, and he does a lot of this against incredible odds. He is a very, very big deal. But now his ministry is coming to a close. And Elisha is going to be the one to take the reins from here. 2 Kings chapter 2. This is how the story begins. When Yahweh was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. And Elijah, and Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for Yahweh has told me to go to Bethel. But Elisha replied, As surely as Yahweh lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went down together to Bethel. And the group of prophets from Bethel came to Elisha and asked him, Did you know that Yahweh is going to take your master away from you today? Of course I know, Elisha answered, but be quiet about it. So at the outset of this story, we get a little bit of a spoiler as to how this is going to turn out. Elijah is going to be taken up in a whirlwind. You'll be talking a little bit about that tonight. But before they do that, he goes on this journey. And, and he's about to leave from Gilgal, and he, he tells Elisha, hey, I want you to stay behind. i got a little journey to take. We don't know why he asked him to do this. We think it might be some kind of a test for Elisha to see what will happen. At any rate, Elisha refuses and says, there's no way, man. I'm, I'm sticking with you all the way through. 
And so they travel down to Bethel, and this group of prophets, it seems to be some sort of kind of like a guild of prophets, um, probably under Elijah's leadership. They come out to greet him, and they tell him, hey, you, you know that he's leaving soon. You, you know that he's about to leave you. Elisha knows, of course, but he doesn't want to talk about it. We think, actually, that it's probably been about seven to eight years since Elijah has first called Elisha. So eight years they've been walking around day after day, and, and Elijah's been pouring into him and teaching him, and they've been building this friendship and growing together, and now, like that, he's going to be leaving. This is a hard day for Elisha. The text continues in verse 4. It says, Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for Yahweh has told me to go to Jericho. But Elisha replied again, As surely as Yahweh lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went on together to Jericho. Then the group of prophets from Jericho came to Elisha and asked him, Did you know that Yahweh is going to take your master away from you today? Of course I know, Elisha answered, but be quiet about it. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for Yahweh has told me to go to the Jordan River. But again, Elisha replied, As surely as Yahweh lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went on together. Now, this is a pretty rough day for Elisha. Okay, not only is his longtime mentor and friend about to leave, but apparently, like at every stop, he's trying to ditch Elisha everywhere he goes. And then you got these dudes who keep coming out, and they're like, hey, you know he's leaving you, right? And Elisha's like, yeah, dude, I know. Shut up about it, okay? Like, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. But, but they move on from Jericho, and they make their way to the Jordan River. And this is what it says in verse 7. Fifty men from the group of prophets also went and watched from a distance as Elijah and Elisha stopped beside the Jordan River. Then Elijah folded his cloak together and struck the water with it. The river divided, and the two of them went across on dry ground. So they come to the Jordan River. You need to know this. The spot that they're at is not random. This location on the Jordan River, right there next to Jericho, 550 years earlier, this is the exact location where the Israelites came across the Jordan into the promised land that God had given to them. And when they went in there 550 years ago, it was occupied by the Canaanites, which means it was a land dominated by idol worship. And Israel's job was to conquer this land, this nation, in the name of Yahweh and to set up the worship of the true God. Now, here we are 550 years later, and the Canaanites aren't there anymore. Now it's the Israelites, but once again, the land is dominated by idol worship. And, and what scholars think is happening is that Elijah is setting up this kind of symbolic uh, commissioning for Elisha. That he takes him across the Jordan River, and then Elijah's going to go up, and then Elisha, just like the Israelites so long ago, his job is to cross over the Jordan River into the Promised Land, and then to conquer it in the name of Yahweh again. It's pretty cool. Also pretty scary. Also probably a little bit overwhelming. See, Baalism, the worship of Baal, is, is still going pretty strong. It may have been weakened a little bit during Elijah's reign, but it's, it's still going pretty strong. And, and Ahab, he's dead now, but his son, who's not much better than him, is still sitting on the throne. And more than that, Jezebel, the biggest enemy, she, she's still alive and well at this time. There's got to be something in Elijah going, how in the world does God expect me to do this? And without Elijah, like at this pivotal moment he's leaving and now it's sitting on me to do all of these things um, when I was in high school and I would come to CIY conferences like these I would hear about all these big needs in the world all these things where God's heart was things like orphans those in the foster care system I would hear about uh, people on the other side of the world who did not know the gospel and needed to hear I would hear about extreme poverty and and injustices and those kinds of things that needed to happen I, I remember actually uh, a CIY in which we were called to write down the name of someone that we loved, someone that we felt like needed to know Jesus and I remember writing that name down and holding it with me and, and and all of these things I would hear all these challenges to go out and do this kingdom work and I would be challenged to write down this name and I remember being so like uh, excited about this and so pumped and I was ready to go home and take on the world but then as I grew older 
like college and then beyond college, those, those same challenges started being a little less exciting and a little more overwhelming to me. Like, how, how in the world am I supposed to do all of this? Did you know that there are 6,000 unreached people groups on the planet today? That is, 6,000 nations or tribes or languages uh, of people where less than 2% of the people there know about Jesus. Do you know there are 154 million people who have never had the Bible translated into their own language? That there are today in America alone 440,000 kids in the foster care system. <laughs> what are you supposed to do in the face of numbers like that? What am I supposed to do in the face of numbers like that? That seems overwhelming. That seems impossible. But, but for just a second, put all that to the side. Let's put the stats to the side. I just want to talk about these names. Last night, you were given this challenge to write a name down here of someone that you felt like God was putting on your heart. So you came up here and you wrote down Jaden, or you wrote Megan, or you wrote Dylan, or Brandon, and you wrote their name down on there with this conviction in you that God wanted you to go home and, and tell that person about Jesus, or invest in that person and disciple them so that they could grow up in their faith. And then Damien stood up here and preached to you about the importance of sharing what Jesus has done in your life and not holding it in. And there's some of you who came up here, and you would write down a name, Richard, and, and you write down Richard's name, and you've got this excitement inside of you and this passion inside of you after hearing the sermon last night. And the truth is, as excited as you are for CIY to continue, there's part of you that would be ready if it ended right now because you're ready to go home and talk to your friend about Jesus. But then there's a lot of you, my guess, who, who feel just as much conviction and just as much passion, but if you were honest there's a, a fair amount of fear mixed in there as well. There's this part of you that goes, man, I, I feel like I'm supposed to go home and talk to Brandy. I feel like I'm supposed to go home and talk to Joseph, but, but man, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. I don't have the gift of evangelism. And, and this whole idea kind of freaks you out, or, or maybe you're even going, man, my own life is a mess. I got so many sin issues that I'm trying to overcome. I've got so many mental or emotional things that are working on me. Who am I to be able to do these kinds of things? Like, if I'm Joseph's best chance at hearing about Jesus, if I'm Brandy's best hope for knowing God, then what kind of hope does she have? There's got to be someone better suited for this. Back to the Jordan, verse 9. When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. Okay, pause real quick. Put yourself in Elisha's shoes. You are there at the Jordan. Elijah is about ready to leave, and he turns to you and he asks you this question. Before I leave, what do you want me to do for you? What do you ask? In that moment, what do you ask Elijah to do for you? I, I know what I ask. Uh, yeah, I know what you can do for me. Don't leave. Stay, please don't go. And if not that, then I'm going to start asking, teach me how to speak like you do. Teach me to speak with the boldness and the authority that you speak. Or, or teach me some of your leadership skills to lead all these other prophets. Or, or you know that thing you do when you call down fire from heaven? That would be a handy trick. Could you show me how to do that? What do you ask him in that moment? Actually, no, scratch it. Forget Elisha's shoes. Place yourself in your shoes for a second. Tomorrow, you go home and you've got this name that the Holy Spirit has put on your heart. Tomorrow, you've got, you go home and you've got this conviction for some sort of kingdom work or some task that you feel like God is calling you to do. If Elijah walks up to you in this moment and says, what do you want me to do for you? What do you ask him for? Here's what Elisha asks in the second half of verse 9. He says this, and Elisha replied, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. That's what he wants, a double share of your spirit. Now, just so you kind of understand, double share, he's not asking to have twice as much of the spirit as Elijah had. Double share, that's like inheritance speak back then. You see, before a father would die back then, he would divide up all his possessions among his sons. 
But because it was the oldest son's main responsibility to carry on the family name, to carry on the family business and the family honor, to ensure that he was able to do that, the oldest son always got the double share. He got twice as much as every other son, the double portion. And so what Elisha is asking for is like the oldest son's portion. He's essentially saying, I am willing to carry on the work that you do. I'll carry on the family name. But I cannot do the work that you do without the power that you have. Whatever this thing is at work in you, whatever you've got going, that Holy Spirit inside of you, I need the Spirit of God to be working in and through me. And Elijah says, that's a tough one. He says there, um, you have asked a difficult thing, Elijah replied. If you see me when I am taken from you, then you will get your request. But if not, then you won't. Now, spoiler alert, he gets his request. Verse 15, we'll later see Elisha coming back, and these prophets are looking at him, and they go, whoa. They see something that makes them go, whoa, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. They can see it. And as it turns out, this is exactly what Elisha needed. Because Elisha is going to, with that spirit, walk across the Jordan River, and he's going to go back, and he's going to start doing some of the same things that Elijah did. More than that, he's actually going to do some things you could argue are greater than Elijah did. He's going to do some more impressive miracles and maybe have more success in ministry than Elijah did, which doesn't seem to make sense at first. I mean, I thought Elijah was the greatest of the prophets. So then how is Elisha able to do all the things that Elijah's doing, and, and some even greater than that? Well, the answer to that is simple. It's because um, Elijah's ministry and power never had anything to do with Elijah in the first place. It was not his boldness. It was not his courage. It was not his speaking ability that accomplished things. It was God doing those things through his spirit. And that spirit doesn't stop. When Elijah's gone, his hands aren't tied. He's not stuck. He'll continue to do this same work through Elisha. Catch this. Different prophet, same spirit. Different prophet, same spirit. And when Elisha's gone, he's going to go ahead and use Isaiah. And when Isaiah's gone, he can use Jeremiah. And when Jeremiah's gone, he can use Ezekiel. He's not tied to any one person. He can use anybody. Actually, I should clarify that. That last line is not entirely true. See, for most of human history, it didn't work this way. For most of human history, only a select few people ever got to experience the Holy Spirit. These very special and unique people that God had called to this special and unique task. And it wasn't for real long. He would just come on them temporarily to help them accomplish the task. He couldn't stay there. People were too unholy for the Holy Spirit to live inside of them. And so he would come on them and accomplish a task. Sometimes it would be for a few minutes. Sometimes it would be for years like Elijah. But it would be this temporary thing. And it was only for the special, not for like the everyday normal people like you and I. So like Elijah gets the Holy Spirit. His next door neighbor Dave doesn't get him. Uh, Jeremiah gets the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah's cousin Ashley doesn't get him. She's left to figure this out on her own a little bit. That's how those things worked, and it always worked that way. Only these special people got the Spirit. Fortunately, this is not the last story in the Bible where a great leader leaves. 900 years later, it happens again, and this story changes everything. It's roughly 33 AD, and this Jewish teacher named Jesus is sitting in a room with his 12 disciples. And over the last three years, they have watched him do these amazing and incredible things, things that are blowing their minds, and they have come to believe that he's not just a teacher, he's not just a man, he is the promised Messiah, here to restore the kingdom of God, here to bring people back to what it ought to be, to set Israel free. Only in their mind, of course, they're thinking that he's going to be like a physical king and set up a physical kingdom, and he's going to conquer the Romans, and they're so excited for it. This is finally the time we've been waiting for this, we've been praying for this, and then Jesus drops this bombshell on them, and he says, hey, by the way, just so you know, I'm leaving. And you think Elisha is distraught. You think Elisha is overwhelmed. They can't believe their ears. This can't be happening. Not right now. What are we supposed to do? These aren't prophets like Elisha. These are everyday, normal people, fishermen, tax collectors, and a bunch of other nobodies. What are we supposed to do with Jesus leaving now? And then Jesus says something ridiculous. He says to them, actually, it is best for you that I leave you. 
What? That, how could it possibly be good for anybody, better for anybody, to not have Jesus with them? But then Jesus goes on to clarify, and he says, no, no, if I go, and by go he means if I die on a cross, and if I resurrect again, and if I ascend up into heaven, then I will be able to send the Holy Spirit to you. And when he does that, it's going to be different this time. Because now he's sending this Holy Spirit not to special and unique people, but he's sending it to anyone who has faith in Jesus. And the, and the Spirit is not just coming on them temporarily. He's actually going and living inside of those people, changing them, cleaning up the mess, healing the brokenness, and making them into a new kind of people, and then restoring them and sending them out. And when that Spirit comes into these 12 nobodies, these 12 nobodies go out and turn the world upside down. And here's the amazing thing. That same Spirit now lives in you if you are a follower of Jesus. That same God, you know this, right? Listen, the same God who calls down fire on Mount Carmel, the same spirit who raised little boys back to life under Elijah and raised Jesus back to life, that same spirit that works throughout the world through the apostles, that same spirit now lives in you. That same spirit now empowers you for success. This is really important. He's there when you go to share good news with these people. Catch it. Different kingdom worker, same spirit. Different kingdom worker, same spirit. Different kingdom worker, same spirit. That does not mean, by the way, that this will work like magic. That when you go home and you talk to Dylan about Jesus, that when you go home and you talk to Megan about Jesus, that it's just automatically going to happen. No, Elijah even faced resistance. Elisha faced resistance. What I'm trying to tell you, though, is that this isn't all on you anymore. It's not your job to do this. It's the spirit's job in you. Your job is simply to be faithful. I, I want you to feel the weight of responsibility for these names. I want you to feel the weight of responsibility for unreached people groups and for uh, kids in the foster care system. I do not want you to feel the crushing burden of thinking that you've got to take care of it. You don't. All you've got to do is be faithful to what God has laid out in front of you, and he is able to do those things. Listen, throughout history, be it Elijah, be it David, be it Elisha, be it Jeremiah, be it the apostles, the kingdom workers have changed over and over again. But the God who calls the workers has never changed. He stays the same yesterday, today, and forever. He sends the workers, and he empowers the workers. So I don't know what exactly God is calling you to. I don't know which one of these names are yours on here. I don't know if he's called you to be a missionary or to go home and help in poverty somewhere or if he's called you to go work in the foster care system, but I do know this, that the exact same God who calls you also equips you. The same God who's calling you to share the good news gives you his Holy Spirit to do that. So when you go home tomorrow, know this, that you go home in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit to do the work that he has called you to. And so go home with boldness and joy to do those things. Let me pray for you and we'll be done.